Well, we come now to the final chapel time of this Chamber Fest week. As we've been considering, you remember, Daniel for discipleship today. And it is fitting that we conclude with a brief look at Daniel chapter 7. As scholars concur that the visions set forth here make it the hinge chapter of the book of Daniel as a whole. It really is the hinge that connects it. But even more befitting uh, our conclusion, I think, is the fact that the central theme of such a hinge piece vision, or visions actually, is none other than Christ himself and his kingdom. So let's just read the passage now, Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 to 14. I kept looking until thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him. Myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat and the books were opened. Then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom. That all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Now, before we can say anything legitimately about the vision set forth in verses 9 to 14, actually two visions there, we must, uh, in proper biblical study, exegetically, set it in the context of the vision that's set forth in verses 1 to 8. Even though we really can't take time to either read those opening verses or study them, Uh, properly this morning, but I'll just summarize their relevance to this context. But only to say that this is clearly what is called apocalyptic language. It's speaking of a revelation, of a disclosure, an apocalypse, an unveiling through very symbolic and mysterious and pictures that represent in quite graphic and imaginative ways apocalyptic literature. Depicting, really, though, here in verses 1 to 8, historical developments plainly involving God and history. This is one of the key elements of our Christian faith and belief that God actually works in the midst of history. It's not a part, it's not esoteric floating around in the skies, it's actually part of human uh, chronology, time. It's very important because many faiths don't attest to that or claim that at all. The refugees I work with are all from Muslim backgrounds, and Islam does not 
relate the actual teaching of the Quran other than the historical figure of Muhammad to any serious attention to history. But Christianity says history is the stage upon which God works and it's verifiable. It's, it can be studied, it can be assessed. So this is apocalyptic language in verses 1 to 8 involving God in history such that we can say two things uh, without any sense of hesitation at all about these verses. One is that God is unquestionably involved in history, which is as much to declare that God is active in real life and God is active in real time. And two is that God is actually not only involved in history, but in charge of history, such that real and radical disciples can implicitly trust the ebb and flow of times and seasons and eras and historical developments and their ultimate outcomes as under the authority of God. No matter the distress of a particular era or time or even in your personal life, God is in charge of history. He's involved in it and he's in charge of it in Christian teaching. And this apocalyptic vision of verses 1 to 8 really verifies the developments of various kingdoms throughout time. We're not going to take time to look at them now. Having said that, about the first vision, we can now turn to the second vision in verses 9 to 10, which obviously focuses on the Ancient of Days. I kept looking until thrones were set up and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were burning a burning fire. A fire, a river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him. Myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat and the books were opened. It is clearly a reference to God himself, Atik Yomin, the ancient one of days. Yatik, the ancient of days, Yomin. But we must give a proper, what the fancy language uses, proper hermeneutical attention. Who can tell me what hermeneutics is about? Have you met my friend Herman Utik? <laughs> Anybody know Herman Utik, Jonathan? Hmm? Well, it, it can involve a study of the Bible, but it could really involve a study of any, anything, anything at all. Anybody else a little more specific? My, f yes. Like interpretation? Yes. <laughs> Hermeneutics is all of the techniques uh, with integrity that go into how we interpret. I mean, we can read what it says, but hermeneutics is the science that looks at how we make decisions about interpretation. It's really critical to follow biblically integral hermeneutics. How do we do that in a way that honors the Bible? So we want our good friend Herman Utik to be clear here in terms of what this is a saying to us in this unique manner of ascribing such a name to God, the Atik Yomin, the ancient one of days. <coughs> 
both parts of the title ancient and days have something in common, don't they? They are both designations about time. So that it could likely be that the imperial Aramaic language here is a very helpful reminder for ardent disciples like Daniel that God is the source of time. Time is not out of the parameters of God's work, both in history and in personal events, personal time frames. You think about it, when you are in a period of serious and severe testing, it is a huge bone, boon, huge blessing to know that God is the source of time. And thus, perhaps, how long periods of testing and difficulty and trial may last for you. These refugee people I love coming to faith, coming out of Muslim backgrounds, some of them are waiting many, many long months and even years with total limbo, their life in the balance with whether they will be given asylum, whether they will have a visa to live and work in Scotland. And to assure them, without platitudes, but just Really, the timing is in God's hands. You can trust that. So many times in my life, to back up and say, I don't get it, this is difficult. But God's timing I can trust. The Ancient of Days tells us timing is surely in the hands of God. Do you believe that? Will that impact how you live? However, we are aided in our exegetical fidelity to this passage by seeing how this name, Ancient of Days, is expanded upon in the successive verses of Daniel 7. We didn't read that far, but if you move ahead to verses 22, 25, and 27 in particular, in which this one who is called earlier the ancient days is further referenced now as the highest one. One is a name designation dealing with his authority over time. This one is positional, the highest one. And we could go to such lengths to talk about the implications of that, but I'll just say this. Radical disciples, like a Daniel, clearly know and acknowledge and even live by the recognition that God is the highest one. I think your... Being a disciple will really hinge a lot on, is God actually the highest value through Jesus Christ? Paul picks this up in his letter to the Colossians, verse, chapter 1, verse 18, I think one of the most powerful statements, that in everything Christ might have supremacy first place, highest. If you're going to be a radical disciple, God is the highest one. But this vision goes on to suggest some very important aspects with regard to this God of history, who is in fact the ancient of days, the highest one, but it goes on in these verses of verses 9 and 10 to focus on his very character. Firstly, the very height of morality. 
portraits actually of holiness that defines him. Pictured here as bearing a vesture like white snow and hair like pure wool, verse 9a, these are apocalyptic images of moral holiness. Suggesting, as they rightly do, that the various moral demands placed upon humanity are meant to reflect the moral stature or very holiness that that adheres within the creator himself that is defined by God's character. And so, for example, just one amongst many, but one that I know many of you will be dealing with or certainly maybe even very much are now in terms of sexual boundaries. Boundaries sexually that the Bible lifts up before us are not simply perfunctory rules, do's and don'ts. They reflect the character of God. Moral standards, sexually or in any other area, but today this area is really under debate and discussion, and I know in your lives as young men and young women, there is all sorts of questions. But I just want to say the sexual boundaries that the Bible calls for are not just coincidental. They're not just God's arbitrary, do this, don't do that. They reflect his moral character, his holiness. Secondly, he who is depicted in verses 9b to 10a by a throne ablaze with wheels, wheels, it says, thus moving so as to address particular situations with sovereign authority, wheels that are burning and emitting a very river of fire, it says, all to speak of nothing less, I believe, and scholars really concur, the refining power of God in the world, in cultures, starting with your life, my life. So often in Daniel, the imagery of fire is about refinement. Not hellfire judgment, but refining fire to purify, to make better, to produce gold and silver. That's what I love about you guys. I'm just telling Graham, he's asking me how I was doing. I said, well, I'm just a little bit sad because I got to leave Monday. And I love you because I just see in you these elements. Uh, you're getting some musical fire. <laughs> you're getting, I hope, some spiritual fire to refine so that the gold that is in you shines, the silver that is in you. And it's so incredible to just have the privilege to, to be part of that. Finding power of God. This vision also draws attention in verse 10b to something so important and yet also so, to me, so encouraging. The rightful positional standing of God. Verse 10b, thousands upon thousands were attending to him. Myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat and the books were opened. It speaks in the grandest terms of thousands and myriads attending to God. 
which is more than the idea of serving, but better understood in the broader notion of ministering to God with the many-sided, many multi-faced, holistic life worship of God. That everything these thousands and myriads do, not just their songs, their whole life is an expression of worship. His position, therefore, God's position is the center and object of worship. Now, this time, Daniel's time, as well as for eternity. This positional standing includes so wonderfully his standing as judge who ensures justice. The court sat, we read in verse 10c, and the books were opened. The books of just and godly laws in which all wrongs are righted, all evils unmasked, and every source of ugliness and sorrow removed. God sits as judge is not an onerous, condemning figure. God as judge rights the wrongs, unmasks evil, says it is not intended that this be ugly or sorrowful. That's the eschatological figure of the future because God is judge and he is just, a just judge. But there is clearly a chronological sense to the visions so that we are now both propelled toward and drawn to what is purposely the climax, third vision. So we had a vision in verses 1 to 8, a second vision in verses 9 to 10, and now we come to a vision in which we read in verses 13 to 14, one central compelling character referred to with nothing less than son of man terminology. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. The Aramaic original makes sure to insist that the allusion is more than illusion, as it carefully speaks of one like Kaver Enosh, one like a son of man, which Jesus, you must remember, capitalizes on it, doesn't he, with no less than in the Gospels, 88 references throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in which he has a particular preference in how he defines himself. And what is it? The Son of Man. The vision of Daniel with such uncanny specificity when speaking of the clouds of heaven in verse 13 seems to be specifically in Jesus' purview in Mark chapter 13 as well as in Luke's account in which he envisions that time Mark writes, when they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. 
There can be little doubt but that this one central and compelling figure in this third, the climactic vision of Daniel, is our Jesus, Jesus Christ, the Lord. But this third vision in itself has a storyline all its own. As it records that this son of man, it says, in Daniel's vision, is presented before the ancient of days, verse 13. With a particular agenda to fill based on the, uh, I think we could call it the bestowing role Trinitarian relationship of this ancient one who bestows upon one like the Son of Man in successive order, dominion, glory, and a kingdom. A kingdom which, due to its benevolent nature, its characteristics of love and mercy and forgiveness and goodness and healing and power is meant to grow, to expand, to share its abundance and blessings with the whole of creation. Again, it's no coincidence that the major theme in Jesus' preaching was what? kingdom of God. And so it unabashedly is a missionary agenda, which we cannot fail to notice at all in verse 14 as well, that all the peoples, all the nations, all the language groups might serve him. And so important is this climactic goal in this, the ultimate vision, the final word, the conclusive picture in this, the third and final vision is this, in fact, an everlasting kingdom. The end of verse 14, and his kingdom will not be destroyed. History before this, vision number one, those kingdoms have come and gone. They are given an extension, says the writer of Daniel, but they're over, but there is one kingdom that will not pass away. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. These visions entailing Daniel chapter 7 verses 1 to 14 have a sense of movement and a deliberate chronology and a purposeful climax with a particular goal in view, which can be stated simply, succinctly, but ever so pointedly as for Christ and his kingdom. Daniel 7, 1 to 14, for Christ and his kingdom. And it is the hinge chapter to a book all about radical discipleship, discipleship in exilic conditions. I really do believe that the heart of radical discipleship is in the end fairly simply defined by one overarching goal and agenda that graciously overwhelms an individual like Daniel and serves to incite the passions of entire communities of faith, churches, so as to actively Adhere to the command of Jesus himself to make disciples of all nations. And it can be put in somewhat basic but hugely significant terms 
before Christ and his kingdom. So there only remains to ask the direct question as we conclude this entire week of looking at Daniel. What about you? What about me? Are you going to settle for mediocre discipleship? Laissez-faire following after Christ? Status quo Christianity? Or will you give your life for Christ and his kingdom? and become a radical disciple. With such opportunity and youthful vigor and bursting with talent, will you commit it all toward a truly radical end that is certainly an outworking of discipleship like unto Daniel's for today? I really implore you I sat where you sat, Chehi. And so I know kind of what's happening in your thoughts for the days ahead. So I want to really plead with you just as fervently as I can. Will you address your musical goals? Will you aim at academic goals? Will you strive for career goals? Will you hope for relational goals? Will you aspire, if God so gifts you, to marriage goals, family goals, Christ and his kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and he will add all things unto you. I implore you, bring all that is you and all that you strive for you would be a radical disciple, this should be your heart cry for Christ and his kingdom. And many hundreds of years before Jesus appeared, Daniel had the vision. So we're going to conclude today by Understanding how this relates to this supper of the Lord and why we're concluding this morning with an invitation to this table of the Lord in which even the bread and the juice, the wine of Jesus' body and blood have a kingdom incentive. As in reference to this very meal, Mark records, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. The next time we come to this table with Jesus present will be the fullness of the kingdom. And we express a commitment to be for Christ and his kingdom as we come and take bread in remembrance of his body, broken Take juice in remembrance of his blood given for you. I really want to give everyone permission to uh, decline to come. If for any reason at all you feel this is not time for you, if, there, if you're in a tradition in which such celebration should only be within the confines of a uh, church of your local commitment, we respect that. 
or for any other reason you're not ready to make this commitment, I'm calling you that this table, coming to this table, is your statement for Christ and his kingdom. So please come only as you feel you should. Nobody's going to look askance if you decide not to. Okay?